Okay, well, let us turn to Genesis chapter 4. <clears throat> and we've been talking about Cain and Abel, but the truth is that this is a study in the firstborn son, God's firstborn son. And everything that we will study for a little while now, for the next seven years, will be related to the prodigal son, because that was where the Lord really got me. I mean, isn't it funny that the story of the prodigal son is where God really opened this whole thing up, and he did it because I kept seeing that the prodigal was looking at his father, and his fa the father was looking at the son a different way than he had before. I was going, why is, you know, why isn't he rebuking him for sin and all this kind of stuff? And the pattern holds true all the way through. Well, I'll say, I'll start with Genesis, but we've already been in Exodus, so we know that, you know. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, we have progressed to... Um, down to verse five. And so I have a little thing to read here before we read those verses. Uh, after God showed his pleasure and favor to Abel and his lack of favor to Cain, there arises two conversations, two conversations that God has with Cain, okay? Um, the first is these verses right here, five through seven. And this basically conversation happens immediately after God shows his pleasure to Abel and his displeasure to Cain, and same with their sacrifices. Um, and the second one is located in verses 9 through 15, and that one follows immediately after Abel's murder. Okay, so two conversations. <clears throat> All right, this is uh, the first, beginning with verse 5 through 7. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Um, Well, let me just read this then. While we shall deal with the subject matter further in what will soon follow, let us take, first take note that Cain was angry over what transpired with the offerings <clears throat> and with God's response to them, okay? And uh, when you say, uh, you know, that he was, uh, he was unhappy or, or he didn't show favor to, to Cain and his offering. <clears throat> but he did to Abel. Okay, so we can say that, okay, what we read here is that Cain was very wroth. He got very angry <clears throat> and as we shall see, and as you already know, he got angry at Abel. <clears throat> he didn't take it out on God. He got angry at Abel. And if it was just simply an offering, and okay, well, we can do other offerings. I can learn from this. Any, any number of ways of looking at why is he so angry? Why? And then we introduce the thought that he's angry because this was a situation in which God chose who would be the firstborn among the two boys. And <clears throat> in doing that, again, uh, whoever gets that would have dominion, would have rule, um, you know, would be over. Uh, and would have the respect of all that came after that as long as he lived. So 
Um, so he was angry. So was the elder son and the prodigal son story. So was Esau. And, it, and so it goes, and so it goes. <clears throat> um, so why was he angry? Well, he perhaps thought that God would be so pleased with him and with what he brought in order to please God. In other words, maybe he had some personal reasons to think, I did good. God's really going to like this. Okay, well, you know, I just have to say, you know, not everything that we think it is going to please God pleases him. Not everything that we think is good is good. Um, and it doesn't matter about our best intentions because if it is our best, it's not good enough. Christ is. Christ the firstborn. And that's what the Lord is looking for. And that's what he's looking for in either Cain or Abel. And God shows up. I mean, it doesn't say... That, you know, after he drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, I mean, these guys look like they're older. Doesn't look like he's showing up a whole lot, but he showed up for the altar displays, the sacrifices, the altar displays. He showed up for that <clears throat> because it's at the altar where God sees what he, what he either thinks is representative of his firstborn son or what is really representative of a person who um, who thinks that their offering their sacrifice is good is accept should be acceptable to God <clears throat> um, so he probably assumed that because he had put so much hard work into preparing his offering that the Lord would take into consideration all the sweat and effort that produced it. Well, can you kind of understand that in the natural? Well, I worked hard, da 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 da. But if you do remember the scripture we quoted last time was that that was part of the curse. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to do this. So God's not going to go, well, this is really good, you know. <clears throat> now, you know, and we have to be real, amen? Anybody like to be real or anybody want to be, even if you're not? <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, in our situation, we've kind of forgotten about the curse. We think that really applied to them. And so... We still work hard by the sweat of our brow to produce something that pleases God, which is ridiculous. And one of the things that I saw, you know, I was, I think I was in Jamaica as a missionary when I first saw it was I really, really now, I mean, because I had been studying the tabernacle, I really, really saw that every offering that was offered in the Old Testament represented Christ and was only acceptable on that basis. And in the New Testament, every offering has to be Christ or it's unacceptable. That's the only acceptable sacrifice. Okay? So, um, well, how do we do that? Well, we bear about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We, we see his nature overshadow our nature when we want to get angry or when we want to, you know, <clears throat> whatever. When, when somebody did us wrong or we didn't get our way. When we didn't get our way. And our way is not Yahweh. <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> Your way is not Yahweh. Well, years ago I was I was doing Frank Sinatra and I said, I did it Yahweh. Anyway. I mean, uh, who was it? Some famous oh gosh. I like Willie Nelson, but I just read in the news this morning that he did a Frank Sinatra tribute 
and the main song that he's doing is I Did It My Way. And I was thinking, and he's 80 something, you know, and I'm thinking, it's not long before you're gonna stand before God and the last big song you wanna put out is you did it your way? I don't know, I think weird. I, no, I think, I think Jesus. <laughs> I think Jesus. That's what. That's how I see things. I'm just go. This is not good, buddy. Don't do that. <clears throat> All right. So, and I know Mike Gentry. You like uh, Willie Nelson, so I need you to call him up and talk to him, okay, and tell him not to do that. <clears throat> um. Uh, that all of that all of Kane's efforts, all of his sweat. All of his hard work should have earned him something. And how discouraging would that be if you stand before God and, you know, he doesn't have respect under your offering? Okay. Well, I think it happens all the time. So what do we do? We go, okay, well, what is it you want? Please talk to me, overshadow my brain. Just move on me in such a way so that I can see exactly what I want, uh, what you want. And then the Holy Spirit will say, well, you know, he wants Jesus and that's my job and you're so busy being spiritual, you don't need me. You only need me so you can feel better during the worship service because that's where you mainly relate to me. Well, that's... That's not a good way to go when Jesus said, I'm, I'm going away, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to really teach you me, not the one that you guys walked for three and a half years. <clears throat> so, um, therefore, when he and his sacrifice were seen as unacceptable, he must have been very disappointed. But, but when he saw his younger brother not only get approval, but be placed as the firstborn, then he became angry at his brother. And, uh, and I wrote, it's not fair, exclamation point. And my, in my iPad, the words not fair are in red, and they are, <clears throat> have been in red from um, the prodigal son story, and will be in red all the way through and I am amazed. I am. I could write a book, I think, by now, on unfair, and what what we would automatically assume is unfair. And God says it's not unfair. And again, I'll just tell you flat out. Why don't you study Romans nine? It'll tell you. Well, has the has the clay said to the potter? Da 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 da. All this stuff. We go, yeah, oh no, I, I believe that, and da 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 da. And then we go against it all the time because God has a choice, and God's choice is always going to be his firstborn son. Amen? Amen. Dilly dilly. Dilly dilly. <laughs> it just came to me while I was just getting a drink. So, so there's that. <laughs> okay. So. <clears throat> Uh, my girls will know that I raised them up, and I said, you know, we go to a lot of fun places, but we never go to the snot fair. I did. You asked them. I, I said, we don't go to the snot fair. Daddy, it's not fair. She gets this, and I didn't get it. We don't go to the snot fair. I did. It was a regular thing because that's a regular thing that comes up with everybody. This is snot fair. You really want to go to a snot fair? <laughs> it's gross. Yeah. Did you hear what Lindsay said? Ah, there's your title. <clears throat> we don't go to the snot fair. Um, so, um, I mean, it sounds, it sounds crazy and whatever, but it was a lesson I had already learned from the Lord that this thing is not about what's fair to me. This thing is about what's the son to the father. Now then I didn't know the fullness of his firstborn son, but I knew enough to know 
I knew enough to know it is not about me and what's fair to me. It's about his son that he gets the son of his love out of me and out of us. So my, my answers to my children were we live off of a different table. We eat of a different sacrifice. We, our life is, uh, is, is um, circumvented, is not circumvented, is the circumference of it is all about Christ and him crucified and that this is, that we have to see it this way. And s still, you know, I mean, times would come up. They got older and everything. That, those words, it's not fair. They came up constantly. And you still had to say, you still had to hold the ground. It is not about that. It never will be about that. You can learn. I can even teach you and develop you in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but you shouldn't eat of it. I'm going to spend your whole growing years teaching you how to function with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but don't eat of it. Is that what we're going to do? You know? No, it's about Christ. And... When it's about Christ, guess what? When it's not fair, it has nothing to do with it. It's, a, it's about letting Jesus come out of you. Okay? <clears throat> Rejoice with those who are blessed, right? Weep with those who mourn. <clears throat> but not, you know, rejoice over those who mourn because I got the blessing this time. You know, they're just simple little things, but they're the heart, they go to the heart of who Jesus is and who we're supposed to live according to. I don't know. For some reason, I can hear somebody saying in their head, well, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, had a, I have a good saying I could say right now, but I'm not going to say it. Something about choking on your snot, or anyway, something like that. <clears throat> All right. Thank God I didn't say it. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Is it warm in here? Is that my imagination? It, it's my imagination. It's not fair that I have to stand up here and teach when it's, it's not fair. <clears throat> no, no, I, I don't have any fans. <laughs> I'm all alone. <laughs> all I've got is Jesus. Nobody can take him away from me. It's so sad, isn't it? Isn't it horrible? <laughs> Lord help us. <clears throat> okay, other than God issuing approval for Abel's sacrifice, how can we know that this was about a transfer of birthright? As noted, we shall deal with a more adequate explanation of verses 5 through 7 later, but there is a sentence at the end of the dialogue that, illustrate, or that illuminates this subject. God says to Cain, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, isn't that an interesting sentence? He's saying, if you, you know, unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Up to this point, God had said to Cain that if there were not certain issues then he could have been recognized as the firstborn with the result that things would have been reversed. How? Abel would have been obliged to be under, under him, under Cain, and Cain would have been ruler over him. This language is similar to what God said at the birth of Jacob and Esau, the elder shall serve the younger. And it's, it's in more places than that. Um, you see at a certain juncture with um, Isaac and Ishmael <clears throat> that 
when God said, out of Isaac shall, in Isaac shall thy seed be called, meaning this is, this is going to be, he's going to be the firstborn of everything that comes forth. We're not even counting what comes forth from him. And put him out. He was exiled. And, and Isaac became the ruler of what was going to come. Okay? And when we say ruler, I, <clears throat> I will not be able to fully explain that meaning because it is in there but it's a wrong use of the word to be the ruler um, is completely different than what we think even Jesus being the ruler is completely different than what we think he's not just the boss he's not just controlling everything and making everything according to what he wants Anyway, we'll leave it at that. <clears throat> um, by the way, the elder shall serve the younger is also quoted in Romans 9 because it's not fair. That's, a, that's the basis of that whole chapter. And it's an argument. It's, it's not just that, well, God's in control and God does what he wants to do. And who are you, the clay, to argue with him? It's not just that. It goes right to the heart of the firstborn. Yeah, it does. It goes right to the heart of the firstborn. And you're questioning God's choice of his firstborn? That's why God gets upset there. That's why it sounds like, you know, he's not just going, well, you know, I'm God and you shouldn't, you shouldn't question me. First of all, that'd be pretty petty, wouldn't it? I mean, have you ever read it like that? That, you know, this is kind of petty, you know, that God, you know. Uh, but it's not that at all. It is the choice that he made, he made before the foundation of the world, and he founded the world on that choice. And that choice was that in all things, the firstborn would have the preeminence. And then we go, well, then, but why did you, you know, this and that, you know. I mean, there's so much. I Probably when we get over in Jacob and Esau, I'll really pull it out and we'll go over it and look at it. But it's, it's, it's just good. It's just really good. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so the, the elder shall serve the younger. And when God said or reacted to Abel's sacrifice in a favorable way, and Esau got mad, he said, well, if you, if you did well, you know, you would be the ruler and he would be serving you. So it's a displacement of the firstborn based upon uh, Okay, it's a displacement of the firstborn based upon birth order and replaced with God's choice. And I put Romans 9, God has a template, but he does not have to explain his choices, his choice really. It's always his choice. It's the altered son. Anybody remember that? Yes. Yeah. It's the altered, and it's not A-L-T-E-R, but A-L-T-A-R-E-D, the altered son. And, you know, I said, I said that he, <clears throat> he finds this at the altar. Um, you see that here. You see that at the prodigal son with the fatted calf. I mean, say, I question, I, let me tell you something. I question what, and I, I shared back then, uh, I questioned when I first saw it, and I, it came out of my mouth to say that the offering of the fatted calf or, was an offering, not just somebody killing something to eat. 
I questioned it because it didn't explain. But the prodigal son story doesn't explain a lot that the whole book of the Bible explains. And when I started getting after it, I went, that's exactly what that was. See? And I remember saying when we were in the prodigal son, I said, stick with me, and I'll show you a pattern that goes over and over and over. So you get, you get the same thing with, uh, with Isaac. Okay? Yes, in chapter 21, cast out the, the bondwoman with her son. But in chapter 22, God tests that reality in Abraham. And he attests it at the altar. And so, so, you know, just on a practical level, I, can I say I got news for you? You may be resisting the altar on a regular basis and proving that it's not the firstborn in you, therefore, you know, and, and you prove it again once if you are deemed a firstborn and you don't give yourself to the altar. Exodus, anybody remember that? Remember the firstborn, I save you for sacrifice. I save you so that you'll bring my altered son, my firstborn son, Christ, out of you to me, that you're giving it to me, not to the church or not so people be impressed or not so, you know, all of this kind of stuff. These, these are real issues. I mean, coming out of Egypt, you're either Israel or you're the firstborn. And if you're the firstborn, you're either truly deemed the firstborn, like when Abraham offered Isaac, what did God say? He just... He just burst like a river going forth. In blessing thee, I will bless thee. In multiplying, I will multiply thee. And I will, well, he'd made promises like that before. But he said, now, because you gave me your firstborn, the firstborn son, because you did that, in blessing, I will bless thee. Now it's all fulfilled. Now we've come full circle. All right. So. Now, just real quick in your mind, run through your life since you've been a Christian up till now and spot all the times that it was an opportunity to give the firstborn son and you didn't do it. Okay, just real quick. It shouldn't take long. I'm sure there's only like three, four times a day, <laughs> an hour, I don't know. Okay, <clears throat> well, again, it's the same, it's the same deal, isn't it? The deal is, I'm alive right now. One of the things that I learned a long time ago is that you can start over right now. All you got to do is say right now. You know, it doesn't mean everything magically changes, but it means, hey, I, I am not for that, with that. I am ashamed of that, and I certainly don't want to stand before you one day with all that. You know. I would like to begin the process of letting the firstborn go unto you in sacrifice. So send the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to get me. And get me, I don't know what that means, Lord, but you do, right? Because it's a real thing with him. He can take that and go, oh, I know exactly what that means. Thank you for praying that. You know, but no, it's, it's good. If you're a firstborn, you'll hate it if you're not a firstborn. <laughs> you'll hate it, so don't pray that, okay? If you, or if you don't want to be one. If you, if you like, you know, if you like Agag, you know, and Agag doesn't make you gag. But for me, anytime I think of him, it's a gag. <laughs> All right. I had said, and this is a good, good thing to end on, a gag. <laughs> um, I had, I've got a meeting with a few of you in my office, and I had said that I would make this short so we didn't wear people out. So the people who you know your name, look up the number. I'm sorry, that's a Beatles song. Oh. <laughs> um, then... You may go to the restroom and do whatever you need to do, but um, let us gather.
Okay, let's have a quick prayer. Father, we just thank you for your son. We thank you for your heart for your son. We do not we do not accuse you over your choice because your choice isn't somebody else that's that you're saying is better than us when they're not. You're, it's your son. And you we can't see that because we're so self-focused. So we're asking you to help us to see by your eyes, Father. Let us see the Son the way you see him, and we will quickly fall to our knees, bow down, and, and try to disappear so that he can come forth. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, not in our name, not in our, our family name, we, we rebuke our family name, and we come to you in your family name, in the name of Jesus. So cover us and draw us close and, and bring your heart realities into us. We ask it, not in our name, in the name of Jesus. Everyone say it, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And Satan, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. All the junk that you've been able to get away with and all the things that were so not Christ, we rebuke you. We tell you we're not yours. We do not belong to you. We belong to Jesus. We may not have acted like it, but we do, and that's legally true, but bought and paid for by the cross. So in the name of Jesus, you be gone. You be gone. And Father, we ask that if there's a time we need to do that in more earnest, to do some deliverance in more earnest, that you show us when, you, and you help those who may need it to see with clarity so that they may with faith stand with you against the enemy. We look to you. We wait on your timing. Keep it in our mind so that it doesn't pass by. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, folks.